Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to the Wolverine Caucus 2015. We're delighted to see all of you today. And as you know, these Wolverine Caucus forums are generously brought to you by the Vice President for Government Relations and the Alumni Association of the University of Michigan. We are also being filmed today for public television by the Lansing Public Media. We're excited that they're here joining us as well. We are in an opportunity at this time in history to talk about things that Michiganians and Americans are all concerned about. And we have two of the most uh, prolific speakers here today to discuss that with you. They're going to be introduced to you by State Representative Clint Kesto of the 39th House District in Oakland County. He is a University of Michigan alum, and he has a law degree from Wayne State University. He is chair of the House Judiciary Committee, and he's a member of the Committees on Health Policy, Elections, and Regulatory Reform. Without further ado, I'd like to bring up State Representative Clint Kesto and Go Blue. Go Blue. Thank you. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, we have uh, a great presentation today and two excellent, excellent speakers. But before we get started, I'll give an introduction to them. What's great is that I'm in a, finally, here in Lansing, I'm in a friendly environment. <laughs> I only see one green tie, but that's okay. There's a lot of maize and blue throughout. So uh, we're excited about uh, John Harbaugh, right? Jim Harbaugh, Jim Harbaugh. I'm thinking about the Super Bowl last year. We'll get them both, one way. You know, I was, I, I was talking to someone, and I was so fed up with Michigan's football program, and I've been getting season tickets forever. And I said, this is it, finally, I'm out. I'm done spending, you know, thousands of dollars on these tickets, and then they hired Jim Harbaugh, and I was the first one to sign back up. All right. The Michigan difference, right? Isn't that what it's about, the Michigan difference? The leaders and the best. And that's why we're here today, because we have two wonderful speakers, Marianne, Udal Phillips is the director of the Center for Healthcare Research and Transformation at the University of Michigan. It's a nonprofit partnership of the University of Michigan and Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan, and they promote evidence-based uh, care delivery, improve population health, and expand access to care. She's been the director of the Michigan Department of Human Services. Uh, she came to statewide service from Blue Cross Blue Shield, where she served in leadership role for over 20 years and most recently as the Senior Vice President of Healthcare Products and Provider Services. She also holds a master's degree in Health Services Administration from the University of Michigan School of Public Health, is a lecturer at the University of Michigan School of Public Health, and she serves on numerous boards and commissions. This woman really bleeds maize and blue. But she, you know, she combines cutting edge research with health policy that has a real world effect. She brings that synergy that we're all looking for to healthcare policy. She's working to bring the ever increasing healthcare costs down, which we all need with, with the transition in, of our healthcare system, and at the same time looking to provide high quality care to our patients. She's invested heavily in technology and brought a business perspective to help start Early Childhood Investment Corporation to help our children. So this woman is really on the ground in the academics looking to change policy to better our state and our health care system. We have Dr. John Ayanian as well, who will be speaking. He's devoted his career to making health care better and more fair. Published over 260 articles on access to care, quality of care, health disparities related to cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, renal disease, and other major health conditions. I Googled this individual, and I couldn't, didn't know where to start reading about him. There were so many academic articles in every topic across the board, as you'll, you'll see when he speaks. He's received numerous awards, including the John M. Eisenberg Award for Career Achievement in Research from the Society of General Internal Medicine and the Generalist Physician Faculty Scholar Award 
from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Please help me welcome our two great speakers and go blue. Thank you, and uh, it is really great to be here uh, today. It's such an exciting time in healthcare, and it's so much fun to be back here. I was here a couple of years ago as we were about to launch some of the major changes in healthcare reform, uh, and it's really fun to be back to tell you where we are today. And uh, John and I are, are really uh, colleagues together, looking forward to sharing uh, what we have to share with you today. We're going to talk first, both of us. Uh, we're each going to talk for mm, a little bit, maybe 20 minutes. Um, <coughs> we'll, we'll try to keep it tight. And then we're going to open it up for questions. Uh, we know this is a very interactive group. Uh, we also know we have a range of backgrounds here. For some of you, this is going to be uh, repeat information, a refresher course. But for some of you, I think it's going to give you new information and new backgrounds. So we really, really are most interested in what you want to know about. And so the, the dialogue and the questions will be particularly helpful to, to us. So I'm going to start with uh, sort of an overview of uh, health care reform, an overview of what's happened in our state and nationally as a result of the Affordable Care Act. It is hard to believe that this law passed almost five years ago now. Uh, and it continues to be incredibly controversial, incredibly debated, uh, and almost viscerally so. And it's, I think, for many of us who've been in health care for our careers, uh, it's surprising how much emotion there is around this particular law. So I think both John and I are going to try today uh, to just give you sort of the basic information to understand what is this law actually accomplishing. Try to take it out of some of the more sensational headlines and some of the focus uh, on the debates about the law and just actually look at what's happening both in the coverage world and in the healthcare delivery space so that we, we sort of see how things are changing because indeed the changes have been big, really big. And I really can't emphasize enough uh, how much difference this law has made both in terms of what's happened in coverage and in terms of what's happening in the healthcare delivery world. And, and hopefully by the end of this, you'll see that fuller picture. So to begin with, oh yeah, it's really big. <laughs> I forgot, I forgot. Um, <laughs> so to begin with, let me talk a little bit about uh, the coverage uh, picture. And I think there's no question that this law has helped to reduce <coughs> the percentage of our population that are uninsured. And you see that uh, in these pie charts uh, here in just the pre-coverage uh, expansion <coughs> year and the coverage expansion year. And what you see is that the percentage who are uninsured has declined. And we've seen growth in coverage in both the public and the private sector. And I think that's important for us to understand uh, because this law is very much about strengthening both the public and the private sector. Indeed, one of the reasons why the Affordable Care Act is such a complicated law uh, is because it builds on our existing fragmented system of health care and financing of health care. It doesn't replace it. And it just really tries to fill in those gaps. And to do that, it expands. Medicaid for those states like Michigan that have expanded Medicaid, which is why you see those pub public percentages growing. Uh, and it expands private coverage through the health insurance exchange exchanges, which are principally focused on strengthening the uh, market for individuals who purchase coverage, because that individual market was particularly broken prior to the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. So it does both of those things, and you see that uh, here in these numbers. So what's actually happened? Uh, well, so this is looking just at those who have enrolled through the federal exchanges like Michigan. Michigan's part of the federal exchange. It's not a state-based exchange. Uh, and you can see we've had millions of people who've gotten coverage through the federal exchanges uh, in 2014. And we're on track in 2015 uh, to exceed the 2014 numbers. So in fact, by mid-January, we're now up to about 7.1 million people who have enrolled uh, in health insurance coverage, again, individuals, uh, through the health insurance exchanges on the federal exchange. Uh, about 9 million, 9.2 million people who have enrolled in all the exchanges, federal and state-based exchanges. Uh, and of those who have enrolled, about 
four million, in 2015, about four million are folks re-enrolling from 2014, and about three million are people who are newly enrolling in 2015. So the law is reaching new people as well as folks who were reached last year. Open enrollment goes until February 15th, uh, so we're going to see more people enroll. So many people are getting coverage now uh, through these exchanges, and we know from survey data that many of those people were uninsured previously. So it is having the kind of effect uh, that the framers of the law hoped it would. Now, Michigan uh, far exceeded in 2014 what the expectations were uh, from the Department of Health and Human Services for how many people would enroll uh, in the health insurance exchange in our state. And uh, as of mid-January, we were about 290,000 people who had enrolled uh, in the health insurance exchanges. So 272,000 enrolled in 2014. We're now at about 290,000. Again, we have another month or so, almost a month of open enrollment. So we'll, we will certainly exceed 300,000 people in 2015 who get, will be getting health care coverage through the health insurance exchange. And I think this and the numbers that we're going to see in a minute on Medicaid really speak to the pragmatic approach that we have taken in Michigan to the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. We really have all worked together, and I think it's a tremendous tribute to our state, to try to make this law work as best as possible. From the governor's office, uh, to the health plans, uh, to the advocacy groups, uh, everybody has come together to really try to make this law work, and you see that in these numbers. We've really exceeded all expectations uh, on enrollment, uh, and things have gone incredibly smoothly in our state, really quite amazing. Uh, just so you have a sense of who those are that enrolled in 2014, and I think we're going to see something similar to this in 2015, I think these numbers are actually quite interesting. There was a lot in the press early on when there were the glitches in the healthcare.gov website about whether or not young people were going to enroll or not. And you actually see from these numbers <coughs> that a very healthy percentage of people who enrolled in the health insurance exchange, who got individual coverage, were young people. Uh, very importantly, this middle column here, tremendous number of those who have enrolled in health coverage through the exchanges have gotten a tax credit for that coverage. 87% of those in Michigan who got health coverage on the exchange got a tax credit to buy that coverage. That is very important. It's very important in terms of what is the case that's before the Supreme Court that I'm going to talk about at the end, uh, and very important in terms of how this law helps to make, pe make coverage affordable <coughs> for people. These are essentially people who are either near poor or lower uh, middle class who are eligible for a subsidy. So very, very important uh, help that they're getting to afford health coverage. And then most of those at both the state level and at the federal level who got coverage got it in one of the plans that's called a silver plan, which means that there's about 30 percent cost sharing in that plan. For people in Michigan who get their health coverage through an employer, most of us have either silver or gold coverage. So folks who are getting coverage on the exchange, we're getting coverage that is pretty comparable to what people get who have employer-sponsored coverage. So a really, I think, interesting picture to see of who got that coverage. And we also have a ver something very interesting happening in our state in terms of who is offering <laughs> the coverage. Uh, you know, what this says is that the health plans in our state, and really we see this nationally, think that this law is here to stay. So despite all, again, the political rhetoric that goes on, uh, they, and they think that the health insurance exchange market is a vibrant and vital market that they want to be part of. And so what you saw in 2014, Michigan had one of the most competitive markets in the country. We had a lot of health plans and a lot of products that people could choose from in 2014. We had 10 issuers. Uh, we had 60 plans, uh, depending on where you were in the state. Southeast Michigan, for example, people had some 50 plans to choose from uh, in the health insurance exchange. But look at the numbers in 2014. We had 14 issuers, that's 14 health plans who are now offering coverage on the exchange, so many more health plans that have come into the state. And we have 193 plans, products that are being offered to people. In fact, in some places, there are so many products being offered that it can be a little confusing 
But what it says is that, again, these health plans think that this is a really important market to be in, and it's a very robust and competitive market. And that plays out, if you look at the, uh, this most bottom line here, which is really the most relevant line, we actually saw for the second lowest cost silver plan, which is what the plan that is used to create the tax credit uh, calculations, uh, on average, those plans only went up 1% in premium, 1%. Now, that's because we have so many new entrants, and many of those new entrants came in with lower cost products. It doesn't mean that <coughs> any one individual only saw 1% premium increase uh, in their individual cost. So particularly for legislators in this room, you may hear from constituents that they are upset because they are seeing a 20% increase in cost, and that is certainly possible. It's particularly possible for somebody who had a plan in 2014, didn't go shopping in 2015, kept that same plan that they had in 2014. Because we had so many more entrants come in and because the tax credits are calculated based upon the second lowest cost silver plan, almost every county in our state had a different second lowest cost silver plan in 2015 than they had in 2014. And so it is possible that people could face in their own experience, a much higher premium in 2015 if they didn't shop, but they could have found a cheaper alternative if they were willing to change plans. It's a very complex process, it's a very complex law, and it's hard for people to understand all of that. Um, but you see how this, is, this component of the law is really trying to make the market work. It's very much a competitive market component of the law. Here are those issuers, the health plans that are in our market, the ones with asterisks are new in 2015, so you, you can see the ones that have come into our market uh, and are now out there offering health plans. Again, a really significant growth in the plans that are here in the market. Uh, and here's where we are in Healthy Michigan. So, uh, you know, again, we far exceeded uh, what the expectations were uh, in terms of enrollment in Healthy Michigan. These are the latest numbers. Uh, there are over uh, 533,000 people who are now enrolled in the Healthy Michigan plan. The department's own first year projections were about 320,000. We had some similar projections. I told people now, this year I got a lot of end of the year calls from the media that said, could you make some predictions about enrollment numbers for next year? And I said, absolutely not. <laughs> I've been wrong on all these numbers. I'm not doing it again. And you can see why. But it's exciting. It's great information. John's going to go through more of this in his presentation, so I'm not going to spend much time on Medicaid. Um, but again, a real tribute to what the state's been doing on Healthy Michigan. Uh, so here's on the back on the health insurance exchange for a minute, a picture of where the new plans are in our state. You can see almost every county in our state has new plans. Uh, and this is the picture, and the, and the lighter colors are, uh, the very lightest colors are areas uh, in the state that had very moderate uh, increases. Uh, the dark green are areas that actually saw reductions in the cost of health coverage in their communities. You can see it's only uh, in those uh, three few counties that are deep red, orange, uh, that saw any inc really significant increase in premiums. So you can see most people in the state had a choice of a lower cost health plan or a very modestly increasing cost health plan in 2015 in comparison to 2014. A very competitive market. Last on the coverage picture, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about what would happen to employer-based coverage as a result of the Affordable Care Act. And there were a lot of people who are predicting, and particularly one very famous consulting group that predicted this huge drop in coverage uh, that employers would have as a result of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and you can see from these percentages here that that is not true. That has not happened. Uh, in fact, in Michigan, uh, we've actually seen a growth in employer sponsored coverage over the past year. Now that's probably due to the fact that we have a better economic uh, situation in our state, more people who are employed uh, than we had previously. Uh, but generally across the country, we are not seeing employers drop health coverage as a result of the Affordable Care uh, Act. Now, that certainly could change over time, and it could change as people 
believe over the long haul that the health insurance exchanges are functioning, are robust. There certainly was a rocky start uh, to the health insurance exchange in 2014, and many employers might have wanted to wait to see what happens. But employers offer coverage for many reasons. Uh, most importantly, because they're looking to attract a very uh, vibrant uh, and qualified workforce. And you know that is, uh, to a large degree, I think why we see these numbers here and why I don't think we're going to see a wholesale shift out of offering health coverage by employers, <coughs> again, at least in the near term. So that's the coverage picture. You know, big changes, big increases in the numbers of people who've gotten coverage, both in the private sector and in the public sector. 500, over 500,000 people in Michigan now covered uh, mm -hmm. under the Healthy Michigan program not yet full year enrollment, another 300,000 or so covering, getting coverage under the health insurance exchange, and more people getting coverage under employer-based coverage. So we've seen a significant reduction in the number of people who are uninsured, a real important focus on people who are working, uh, and many who are working poor. And so it's had a huge impact uh, in people's access to health care, uh, and we see that play out in many different ways. And I want to switch now uh, to uh, a brief discussion about what's happening on the delivery system because we spend a lot of time uh, talking about the coverage side of the equation uh, and certainly that's what gets all the press and we sort of miss that the Affordable Care Act is also having very significant impacts uh, on the delivery system and lots of changes are happening in our market as a result of the uh, Affordable Care Act. So, you know, to start with, the law does make some fairly significant changes on the reimbursement front. You know, on the positive side, for two years, it increased primary care physician payments for the Medicaid program, and Governor Snyder's kept a good percentage of that, not the full amount uh, in his budget. Uh, on the more challenging side, many hospitals, you'll hear this from the hospitals, are facing uh, reductions in payment, either reductions in the rate of increase they would have gotten or reductions as a result of readmissions penalties and things like that. The law does. Uh, really focus on improving quality through some of these reimbursement issues and also uh, in reducing costs by making some of these reimbursement changes. Interestingly, yesterday uh, the Secretary of HHS announced that they are setting a goal to move their reimbursement systems to have at least 30 percent of Medicare payments based upon value, uh, which she means uh, providing incentives for performance in a variety of different ways. Today it's about 20 percent of Medicare pay payments are made on that basis. That's a big increase to go from 20 to 30 percent. And this is a bipartisan issue. Um, both Republicans and Democrats believe very strongly that we need to move away from fee-for-service payments that provide incentives to simply do more and instead provide incentives to do better quality, make care more appropriateness, and coordinate and integrate care better. And you're going to see that over time, and you see it starting uh, under the Affordable Care Act in a variety of ways. So there's these new payment models, bundled payments, accountable care organizations. In bundled payments, people get one flat rate of payment for a set of services, whereas in the past they might have gotten individual payments for those services. Uh, and you see a number of providers across the country and in Michigan who are participating in this bundled payment demonstration, testing this new approach to reimbursement. Here's <coughs> accountable care organizations uh, in the state. You see many uh, of in the U.S. and in the state, <coughs> many hospitals and health systems participating in this model called accountable care organizations. Accountable care organizations is designed to encourage physicians and hospitals to work together to take responsibility for a patient population. Many hospitals think this is a transitional approach. It's not going to be a long-standing approach. But it is something that people are experimenting with. They're trying. They are hoping uh, we will show some approaches that do, in fact, save money and improve quality of care at the same time. And so you see that through these ACOs. Uh, and you see on the private side many health plans that are experimenting with exclusive provider organizations. And just as one example, uh, in the health ins insurance exchange, you can see that Blue Cross is offering five different uh, exclusive provider organizations. These are narrow network plans. They have limited sets of doctors and hospitals. 
And what we have learned is that people who get their coverage on the health insurance exchange are very price sensitive. And they are willing to have a very narrow network of providers uh, and trade off that uh, to have lower price. And you see a lot of that happening. So big changes on the delivery side. All of these changes are encouraging hospitals to acquire physician practices, hospitals to come together with mergers. Uh, in fact, we just you know, had the announcement of Crittenton that's now joined the Ascension Health System. We have very few hospitals in the state anymore that are independent hospitals, not part of a larger system. Uh, we have really relatively few physicians in the state that are solo practice, and many of them are now employed by hospitals. And so you've seen, as a result of all of these things, very big changes in how the delivery system is structured, and you're going to see more of that over time. I don't want to miss that there's also a tremendous amount of grant and demonstration of funding under the Affordable Care Act. Since the law was passed, $21 billion has been given out in grants and demonstration projects. Michigan uh, has ranked 14 in the, in the states that have gotten uh, these grants. And you can see uh, what they've gone for. So we've had a tremendous amount of grant funding as a result of the Affordable Care Act for federally qualified health centers, uh, for early childhood programs, a program uh, that is near and dear to my heart. These are for uh, nurse home visiting uh, programs that we know really work to help people. Um, Money Follows the Person is a Medicaid nursing <coughs> home uh, program. Uh, and the state just received the state innovation uh, grant model. We're getting $70 million to implement, building on these concept of ACOs, building on the Michigan Primary Care Transformation Project, which just reported its results, and we, and we are one of few, the few states that have saved Medicare a significant amount of money in that demonstration project. We're all very excited about those findings. And so, you know, all these new models are developing as a part of the Affordable Care Act. So big changes in how we think about and deliver health care. All right, uh, two minutes, and then I'm going to turn it over to John on, you know, what's coming up with regard to the Affordable Care Act. Here's what's happening over the next uh, few years. So this year, just now, uh, the mandate, for the employer mandate, which was delayed uh, somewhat, uh, has gone into effect for groups uh, larger than 100 under the Affordable Care Act. They're required uh, to offer health coverage. In 2016, for groups 50 to 100, they will be required to offer uh, health coverage. Groups under 50 are not required to. Um, we continue to see reductions in disproportionate share payments uh, coming down the road uh, for the Medicaid program. Uh, you know, very interesting, there is a provision in the law, the, the, uh, this particular waiver, the Section 1332, that in 2017 enables states to propose an alternative approach and a, a completely alternative approach to the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and there is a lot of discussion at the state level, it, all, all across the country, about whether they're going to apply uh, for these waivers. We thought Vermont was going to do this. Vermont announced that they wanted to have a single payer system. Uh, and they just announced recently that uh, they are not going to do it, they, that, that all those discussions blew up. So we don't know, but it's going to be a very interesting thing to see. Uh, and then last, in terms of things that are coming down the road in this law, uh, in 2018, uh, there is a, a tax called the Cadillac tax uh, that gets imposed on uh, individuals if they purchase, or uh, groups, if they purchase coverage that is uh, considered uh, very, very broad coverage. Uh, it, there's not actually that much of these, this coverage left, although people are worried that as it gets indexed, more people will fall into this Cadillac tax. These were really directed at very, very broad and generous uh, programs. Uh, and it was sort of the intent to start dealing with the fact that many economists believe that the way we finance healthcare in this country is a very poor way to do it because these benefits are all tax preferred and uh, it's sort of trying to move away from some of those tax uh, favored benefits, but slowly. So we'll see. It's a very controversial part of the law. And I would say people don't like this piece. Uh, they don't like a lot of the law, but they really don't like this piece. Um, Okay, so we now have the politics and what's happening in, uh, uh, in Congress. And of course, you have you know, what um, Mitch McConnell has already announced in uh, Congress he would like to do with the Affordable Care Act. You know, you still, I think next week the House is going to take another vote 
on repealing the Affordable Care Act. Uh, they have taken so far 54. They have voted 54 times to either repeal all or part of the Affordable Care Act, so next week will just be 55. Um, the uh, president, of course, has said he will veto that. So, you know, there are other people on the Republican side who are trying to not, who are saying we shouldn't, that the focus shouldn't be on repealing the whole law, it should be on changing it. Uh, and so here's what Mitch McConnell has said his priorities are, to repeal the employer and individual mandate. These are, again, unpopular provisions of the law. Um, to redefine the full-time employees from 40 hours a week to 30 hours a week. Um, from 30 hours a week to 40 hours a week, sorry. Uh, and uh, to repeal the medical device tax. There, the medical device industry has done a fabulous mm -hmm. job of lobbying in Congress, even though there's a lot of data to show they're not being hurt by this tax. They really have done a, a bang-up job on lobbying. Uh, now, the, the president has said he'll veto at least these first two. We don't exactly know where he is on the medical device tax, but uh, that raises money for the law, and it's unclear where they'd get the money if they repeal that. So, But there is bipartisan support for repealing the medical device tax, so we'll see what happens with that. Uh, and then, you know, particularly interesting and particularly worrisome in Michigan uh, is the case before the Supreme Court, the King versus Burwell case. Uh, this is a case that is challenging the law and the tax credits that are embedded in the law. Uh, and the argument is that the tax credits should just be applied uh, to, or the way that the, they, the way they say that the Affordable Care Act was written is that the tax credits are only eligible in states that have state-based exchanges, not in the states that have gone with a federal exchange like Michigan. Most states, 36 states, have gone with a federal exchange. And as you saw, uh, you know, 87 percent of those who got coverage in Michigan have it with a tax credit. So if this decision that says that, yes, the tax credit can only be applied to the uh, uh, states with state-based exchanges is upheld, uh, then many people who got tax credits will be disenfranchised and will throw the system into chaos. Uh, it is really, a really will have huge effects. Uh, the plaintiffs in this case you know, ha the language that is in the law does say uh, that the state, that the tax credit is applied with state exchanges. Um, but if you read the intent of the law, it, and if you talk to the framers of the law, it's pretty clear that they really didn't mean it that way, that literally. Uh, and it's probably likely that this was a drafting error. There are many drafting errors in this law because of the way it was passed. We can talk about that if you want. It was probably a drafting error. Where the Supreme Court comes out on it is anybody's guess. And it will depend on what John Roberts does. He was the swing vote uh, in the last case on the Affordable Care Act that upheld the mandate. And he will be the swing vote on this one. And it is unclear where they're going to come out. But we know it will be decided around June. Uh, and lots of people are watching it very, very closely, because it will have very big effects on the implementation of the law. All right, last. <laughs> because I can't end any presentation about the Affordable Care Act without talking about public opinion. Uh, and, you know, public opinion essentially, since this law was passed, has not moved. It's pretty negative overall. Uh, but more than that, it continues to be incredibly confused. And people don't understand the law. It's very complicated. Uh, and even those who benefit from it don't understand that they're benefiting from this law. And so, uh, you know, no matter what people believe about the law, one thing I think we can all agree on is communication about it has been terrible. So <laughs> that's why you see this. Um, so that's a very quick run through of um, where we are today on the Affordable Care Act in Michigan and uh, nationally. Uh, and I'm going to turn it over to John, who's going to talk about Medicaid, Medicare in a little more detail. So thank you. So it's a pleasure to be here and bring you greetings from Ann Arbor. As, um, as the representative said, I'm uh, John Ianian. I'm a physician, a primary care physician, uh, as well as a health policy researcher. Uh, in fact, I moved about a year and a half ago uh, from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, where I'd been on faculty at Harvard for approximately 20 years. And, and this was sort of a, a Massachusetts perspective on, on the U.S. Uh, and, uh, you know, Boston likes to, th and Cambridge like to think of themselves as the center of the universe. I think right now they're just the center of a very bad blizzard. But, uh, uh, but you know, my, you know, the perspective of uh, folks in Massachusetts, oftentimes the Midwest doesn't extend much past Worcester, Massachusetts. And, 
uh, sort of the great unknown beyond that. And, and certainly this week, we would not label Nantucket as the tropics uh, <laughs> after the storm they've been through. And moving to Michigan, I really expanded my horizons and, and uh, learned to appreciate the high five spirit of the state of Michigan and sort of the broader sort of uh, perspective on the rest of the United States that, that does extend beyond Worcester. So uh, some of you may appreciate, depending on where you're from, uh, in, in or out of the state, uh, some of these uh, views looking outward. Um, but on a more serious note, I want to talk to you about some of the important health policy challenges that we face in this country. And uh, before uh, adding my perspective to Mary Ann's on the Affordable Care Act, um, talk about a new institute that we have at, at the University of Michigan. Uh, our banner is over on, on uh, side the screen, uh, the Institute for Healthcare Policy and Innovation, which is the university's newest campus-wide institute and, in fact, includes faculty from the Flint and Dearborn campuses as well as Ann Arbor. Uh, this was an institute that was authorized by the Board of Regents back in May of 2011 and really started uh, ramping up in the mid-2012 after the university had acquired a new campus, what's called the new Camp North Campus Research Complex, adjacent to the uh, traditional North Campus where the College of Engineering and, and School of Music, Theater and Dance and other programs are based. And the motivation for this institute was really to bring together the expertise of the university to address some of these very important health policy challenges that we face. Uh, too many children growing up in poverty, the aging of the population, uh, the problems with unaffordable costs to individuals and society, the fragmented and uneven quality of care that we have in the U.S. healthcare system, uh, persistent disparities by race, ethnicity, language, uh, geographic factors, as well as inadequate safety. So lots of big problems that the University of Michigan and other great universities like it really should be uh, devoting uh, the expertise that we have in the both in the clinical and economic and policy dimensions to improving healthcare in the United States and, and across the globe. So our institute was formed uh, with a, a, a very concise mission, uh, but, a, but a very important one, to improve the quality, safety, affordability, and equity of healthcare, focusing on both patients and population health, um, and with four major themes or priorities for the institute. Uh, the first of which is very closely related to the topic we're discussing today, which is evaluating the impact of health care reform. Uh, the second is improving the health of communities, uh, particularly in Michigan, but across the country. Uh, promoting greater value in health care. How can we achieve better outcomes for what we currently spend in health care? Or how could we deliver care more efficiently and, and achieve equivalent or better outcomes at less cost? And then finally, innovating in health IT and new models of health care delivery. <coughs> Um, and our members come from 12 schools and colleges across campus. A little over half in the blue slice of this pie come from the medical school. Uh, we have 21% of our members from the School of Public Health, 6% from nursing, 10% uh, from the other nine schools and colleges across campus, uh, and then 5% from our local partners, such as the Center for Healthcare Research and Transformation that Marianne Udall Phillips leads. And we're now up to nearly 450 members within the Institute. So I want to shift gears now and share my perspective on the Affordable Care Act. And as Marianne mentioned, really focusing, sort of building on the very uh, in-depth and focused look that she provided at through the operation of the insurance markets and the exchanges uh, and, and, and the uh, reforms in care, such as accountable care organizations in Michigan. Um, and sort of also now looking within Michigan and, and more widely at some of the other changes in the law. And sort of reminding that this is all about expanding and reforming health insurance coverage. And there are three main pillars to, to, to the Affordable Care Act. Expanding Medicaid coverage for low-income adults on, on the left, um, promoting the exchanges with subsidies for middle-income individuals and small businesses on the right, uh, continuing to build this on a foundation of employer-sponsored coverage, as Marianne uh, outlined. Uh, but then within the health care system, really uh, implementing the individual mandate, because if we're going to require insurers to take all comers applying for insurance, uh, we need a mandate requiring people to sign up for insurance, or else we can end up with just the sickest, most costly people signing up for insurance and, and sort of lose the, the concept and the, and the, the uh, ability to, to share expenses across a broad population. And then finally, many in, uh, health insurance market reforms, uh, such as those that Marianne discussed. And I look at this as, a, from a historical perspective, we're coming up on the fifth anniversary of the signing of the Affordable Care Act uh, back in March of 2010, what I would describe as the ecstasy, or uh, Congressman John Dingell, one of the longtime supporters of expanded insurance coverage, uh, is sitting beside the president as he signed the law. And then almost a, a year and a half ago, what was really the low point of the Affordable Care Act with the launch of healthcare.gov, 
all the problems with the website and uh, people's ability to sign up for coverage and, and find out what coverage and subsidies they were qualified for. And, um, and then the reality, where are we in, as, as we close 2014 and, and begin 2015? And um, these are some data by, from Ben Summers at the Harvard School of Public Health using national Gallup tracking polls uh, to look at trends in insurance coverage over the past several years. What he found was that uh, prior to the implementation of the Affordable Care Act in the fall of 2013, uh, insurance rates, uninsurance rates among uh, non elderly adults were hovering just above 20% and pretty stable over that time period. And within uh, six to nine months after uh, healthcare.gov launched and the expansion of Medicaid began, um, we saw about a five percentage point drop in insurance, uninsured rates from about 21% to 16%. Uh, and really, uh, I think the first time in several decades that we saw a meaningful decline in rates of uninsurance. So the three key elements as of 2014 are expanding Medicaid coverage, providing subsidized private coverage for those above the poverty level, um, and then the individual mandate uh, with a penalty for those who don't sign up for coverage that started out at 1% of income in 2014, but will actually rise in 2015 and 2016 up to 2.5%. So a, a more meaningful penalty for those who choose not to enroll in coverage and, and can't demonstrate financial hardship. Um, and Marianne talked in, in, in depth about what's happening with the health insurance exchange uh, and, and the market -based marketplace plans in Michigan, but just to sort of frame some of her closing comments about this pending Supreme Court case and which states will be affected if the Supreme Court decides that uh, only state-based exchanges can, um, can offer um, uh, subsidies. And those would be the states shown in blue, and those shown in orange <coughs> or in green are ones that either have are using healthcare.gov or partnership exchanges with the federal government. And those are all the states that would lose the insurance subsidy if the uh, Supreme Court ruled that that was not part of the original law. I want to walk through just some of the high level changes to Medicare because that's very important to the elderly citizens of our state who are enrolled in the Medicaid, Medicare program. Um, in 2011, right after the Affordable Care Act was enacted, uh, the Center for Medicare Innovation was launched to improve the quality and coordination of care. And so they've been overseeing the accountable care uh, organizations, some of the uh, shared savings programs and bundled payment programs. There are some of the more innovative features about the way the federal government pays for health care for the elderly through the Medicare program. Uh, but in order to cover the increased costs of the Affordable Care Act, there were also uh, some reductions in expenditures. For example, uh, about $132 billion in reduced payments to Medicare Advantage health plans uh, that now serve about 30% of the elderly nationwide. Um, and, and because there was a perception that primary care was, was underpaid uh, within the country, uh, primary care payments were increased by 10% uh, within the Medicare program. And also within Medicaid for a two-year period were raised to the level of the Medicare program as well. Uh, so the accountable care organizations started to launch in 2012. These were groups of physicians and hospitals coming together to take shared responsibility for the overall costs and quality of care. Uh, some of those payments to the Medicare Advantage health plans were given back to those plans in the form of quality bonuses. There's now a five-star rating system for Medicare Advantage health plans and plans that can demonstrate high quality uh, in 2012 could earn back 1.5% payment bonuses. And as of uh, 2015, those are now 5% bonuses. Uh, another way that we paid for this Affordable Care Act was by raising Medicare taxes on higher uh, earners in the United States. So uh, single adults earning more than $200,000 or couples earning more than $250,000 per year, uh, starting in 2013, started paying uh, nearly 1% increased tax on earned income and a new 3.8% tax on unearned income, such as interest and, and dividends above those income thresholds. Um, we also, in 2014, were expecting something called the Independent Payment Advisory Board to be launched. This was gonna be like a base closing commission that Congress has used in the past, uh, sort of a nonpartisan uh, advisory body to look at changes in costs in the Medicare program and ways to save money. Uh, that was a very contra controversial part of the law. And in fact, um, that looks like it won't move forward. Uh, the President and Congress have not appointed representatives to this board. And uh, at this point, it looks like it won't be an important part of the policy. And then one popular part of the Affordable Care Act that I want to highlight is that between 2012 and 2020, the donut hole within the Medicare prescription drug benefit, what's known as Part D, uh, which above a certain level, uh, elderly Medicare beneficiaries with that drug benefit were required to cover all of their drug costs. 
Um, that donut hole is going to be reduced so that they'll, uh, by 2019, will actually have 75 percent coverage across the board uh, for all drug costs. And, and that is a particularly popular part of the uh, Affordable Care Act. Um, and then there's some cost containment provisions, which Marianne also touched on in terms of reductions in the fee increases for hospitals and home health and skilled nursing providers, uh, cutbacks on the disproportionate share payments that Medicare makes to hospitals. So the expectation was with more people gaining coverage, hospitals will have less uncompensated care. We'll be following this closely in Michigan and other states. Uh, with those reductions in uncompensated care, they don't need those disproportionate share payments for hospitals that tended to care for large numbers of uninsured patients. And then finally, uh, reducing Medicare payments for hospital readmissions and for hospital-acquired conditions. So if you put all that together, this is an overview of what the Congressional Buz Budget Office has been forecasting for costs of the Medicare program. Uh, and if you go back to 2010, which is the upper blue line, uh, the projected costs out to uh, uh, 2019, which is the forecasting uh, horizon that the Congressional Budget Office uses, uh, were for those costs per Medicare beneficiary to be well over $14,000 per beneficiary. But each year since the Affordable Care Act was enacted with some overall changes in the growth of health care costs in the country as well as some of these cutbacks in Medicare payments, uh, those forecasts have progressively declined so that now, uh, as of 2014, that projection shows that costs at the end of this decade will be about $2,500 lower uh, for uh, Medicare beneficiaries and for the federal government uh, than was expected. And so that's a real, in terms of the federal budget deficit and sort of the crisis that we might be facing in coming decades, a very important change. I uh, want to touch briefly on what's happening with Medicaid. And in fact, um, this is sort of the, uh, shows the states that have expanded Medicaid as of December uh, 2014, uh, which was uh, the, the 27 states and District of Columbia shown in red. Uh, with the blue states opting not to expand Medicaid and the purple states considering it. And in fact, as of yesterday, Indiana announced uh, an agreement with the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services that they will be expanding uh, their uh, uh, Medicaid program um, in a, in a state-specific way like we're doing here in Michigan. One of the important missions of our new institute at the, at the University of Michigan is to uh, really elevate the, the, the views of health policy and health care delivery that, uh, that we have here in Michigan and bring them into the national debate. And one of the ways we've been doing that is with some high profile publications in uh, uh, leading medical journals such as the New England Journal of Medicine or the Journal of the American Medical Association. So I'm um, looking at the changing policy landscape around Medicaid. Uh, one of our colleagues, uh, Charlie Rorick, who's a health economist, has done some of the best work on trends in national health spending. Um, and then uh, one of our faculty from the law school at the university, Nick Bagley, uh, wrote a very important article in December sort of anticipating the potential outcomes of the uh, King versus Burwell uh, Supreme Court case that Marianne described. And in fact, uh, within the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, this was the most viewed article during the month of December with over 400,000 views of this article. And the runner-up was actually 40,000 views. So uh, you know, a journal where we normally think about new drug trials, and you know, it, it really has an important influence on the policy debate as well. And our faculty are, are bringing uh, their expertise to that, that national venue. Um, uh, a little over a year ago, shortly after I arrived in Michigan, I, I wrote about Michigan's approach to Medicaid exp expansion and reform. This was just after Governor Snyder had signed the Healthy Michigan Plan that the, uh, that the uh, state legislature approved. Uh, and I saw this as an opportunity, uh, as with Michigan being one of the few Republican states with a Republican governor and re Republican legislature, one of only four at that time, and now joined by Pennsylvania and Indiana in expanding Medicaid. Uh, but sort of the, the, the state-specific features and the compromise that went into the expansion of Medicaid here, where uh, the Republicans pushed for market-oriented reforms around increased enrollee cost sharing uh, and incentives for healthy behaviors and the use of Michigan health accounts to track enrollees' expenditures and their contributions towards their health care, uh, while also meeting a, a, a strong Democratic goal of expanding coverage for low-income adults. Um, and uh, there were important benefits that I think Michigan came together in terms of expanding coverage, what was originally expected to be over 400,000 and now is over 500,000 low-income adults with uh, Medicaid coverage. And also for the providers in the state, the hospitals, health centers, uh, community health organizations and physicians and other clinical providers, a substantial influx of federal funding, uh, which was estimated to be about $1.7 billion in 2014, because until the end of 2016, the federal government is covering the full cost of this expansion. 
Uh, and so the states that aren't expanding are missing out on, on that, uh, that in, sen in a sense, sort of economic stimulus to their healthcare system, and particularly for some uh, providers that serve very difficult low-income populations. And what I really closed on in this article, and there are copies of it in the back of the room for those of you who are interested, was really trying to hold up Michigan as a, as a model for political compromise at a time when there was very little uh, compromise happening uh, in Washington on Capitol Hill. And then um, just more recently in the fall, we went back and looked at the early experience in Michigan, what we called the first 100 days and the launching of the Healthy Michigan Plan, uh, where we highlighted part of what made this a successful launch for Michigan was close coordination of three state agencies uh, to ensure a smooth launch of the enrollment and eligibility determinations last April, uh, a decentralized approach to outreach and marketing, so really relying on community-based organizations. Uh, to get the word out and, and, and meet with people at the local level to understand their enrollment options. Um, and then working very carefully on the computerized enrollment system and the call center and trying to avoid many of the problems that healthcare.gov had experienced six months earlier when it was launched in the fall of 2013. Uh, and so, as Marian mentioned, the original projection for enrollment was 322,000 in the first, uh, uh, in 2014, and we reached that milestone in the first 100 days. And in fact, now as we've tracked this population out to January 2015, to this month, um, this was as of mid-January, uh, we had 517,000 uh, enrollees. And we've done, uh, within our group, uh, looking at uh, a comparison of some of the basic demographics of the new healthy Michigan population compared to non-elderly adults, so adults 19 to 64 with traditional Medicaid, and uh, about 517,000 in healthy Michigan and uh, about 568,000 in, in Medicaid in that non-elderly adult population. And what you see, this just breaks the state into six regions as well as calling out Wayne County as the state with the largest uh, Medicaid and healthy Michigan enrollments, uh, that those percentages are almost identical between the two programs, so it's clearly reaching broadly across the state in, in a way that, that's comparable to the, the original Medicaid program. And when we look at some of the demographics in terms of the age distribution, this is actually a somewhat younger population. So 46% uh, of the healthy Michigan enrollees are under age 35 compared to 42% of the traditional Medicaid enrollees. Uh, more men are enrolling in this new program, 48% uh, versus six, 36% in traditional Medicaid. Um, somewhat fewer uh, African Americans are a somewhat smaller uh, proportion of the population, 26% in healthy Michigan uh, versus 31%. And then um, it's, some of you may not be able to see this at the bottom of the slide, but um, healthy Michigan, because it relies on income determinations to determine whether people are eligible, uh, tracking uh, who's above the poverty level, who, uh, those are the individuals who will face some of the uh, uh, most uh, important cost-sharing provisions. That's about 18% of the population as of January uh, that have enrolled in healthy Michigan. So some of the key questions, just as to, to close our discussion and then open it up for, for your questions and, and, and perspectives on this, um, as we look forward into 2015, um, there are some important questions looming for the Healthy Michigan Plan. First, will the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services approve a second waiver, which the legislature uh, required in the original enactment of the law, um, to limit coverage for new enrollees to, uh, above the poverty level to 48 months or increase their premiums um, if they stay in the Medicaid program or give them the option to go into the state insurance exchange. And I think that will be a, a difficult negotiation with CMS uh, around that waiver. Um, we also want to uh, continue to, to, to follow whether there are any budget savings to the state uh, that offset some of the state's share of the expansion costs that start at 5% in 2017 and then rise to 10% in 2021. Um, it's important to look at what the health care providers in the state are, are facing in terms of their capacity to meet the needs of over half a million new enrollees. Uh, the fourth question being, what effects will the cost sharing in the Michigan health accounts and the tracking of expenditures and reporting that on a quarterly basis to new enrollees have on their use of services? And then finally, fifth question, probably the most important one is, what effect will this new program have on the health and financial well-being of enrollees? So, those are some of the questions that uh, <coughs> colleagues and I at our institute at, at will be will, will be tracking um, as we look forward to, to what impact this this program is having. And I just want to close. You know, Marianne showed the overall perspective on public opinion, uh, and you know, we've it's been pretty steady. About 45 percent of the American public opposed the Affordable Care Act. Around 40 percent supporting it as it's currently structured, and 15 to 20 percent. I'm really not sure what to think. Um, but when you unbundle the, the, healthy, uh, the, the Affordable Care Act and look at specific components, such as the exchanges in the marketplaces, the subsidies to people uh, getting insurance on the exchanges, the Medicaid expansion, 
all of those programs are over 75% support in the public as a whole, um, and even among Republicans, over half of Republicans support those three major provisions nationally. Uh, it's only when you start looking more at the employer mandate and penalties and the individual mandate and penalties where you see the support for this program drop off substantially, uh, well under 50%. And then, it, we, while we mainly think about the exchanges in Medicaid, there are also changes to private insurance and Medicare that are quite popular with the public. And on the right-hand side of the slide, I show the, the percentages of the public overall that support family coverage for adult children up to age 26. That's 80% of the public. Uh, the closing of the Medicare Part D donut hole, the prescription drug benefit, that's nearly 80%. Uh, the re elimination of cost sharing for preventive services and the elimination of exclusions for pre-existing conditions, um, over 70% public support. And then the rebates uh, that private insurance plans are required to give if they spend less than 85% of their premium dollars on medical care, uh, supported by 62% of the public. And all of those provisions are supported by half to three quarters of Republicans as well. So I think one of the delicate challenges as we think about how the Affordable Care Act evolves is sort of how do we preserve many of these provisions that are very popular with the public if, uh, if, if there's also a, a, you know, a, a strong interest in repealing the law as a whole and, and, and what sort of uh, uh, debate and, and compromise can be reached around that. So uh, this was a political cartoon that came out five years ago when the law was signed uh, showing, I think, the, the Democratic and Republican perspectives on this law. And it's, it's about uh, five years later, I think, uh, where we stand now. And uh, for those of you interested in our institute, we're on the web and on Twitter, and we hope you'll follow our work. Thanks. We'll do questions from any of you. Or yeah. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. I'm, uh, I'm Jim Townsend. I represent the 26th district in the House of Representatives, and I really appreciate the job that you do. It's great information to provide. I've got a. I'm a big supporter of the Affordable Care Act personally, uh, but I do want to raise this critique. It's you know been in been in the news an awful lot in the last few months. Coming insurance marketplace, his critique is that well health care costs are really driven by utilization of you know, hospital services and prescription drugs mm -hmm. and he sees I think he he under calls the policy. I think there is more policy than he gives credit, but he, he's very critical and says, look, there's very little policy in the Affordable Care Act that controls the growth of costs in those elements. And he has some pretty interesting ideas for how to change the insurance market. Yeah, yeah, um, yes, you're absolutely right. Stephen Brill is fascinating, and his latest book, um, which has been much excerpted in The New Yorker and other places, is really very interesting to read. He's got some interesting analysis. I tend to agree with you. I think he's underestimated the parts of the law that actually try to deal with cost, but he's not wrong in total that there is no magic bullet in the law to deal with cost. Uh, you know, the challenge is that the way that the Affordable Care Act tries to expand coverage is, as I said, it builds on the fragmented existing system of health care in this country. We know how other countries have actually saved money in health care, why their spending is less than the U.S. They save money because they pay less to hospitals and doctors and because they make more decisions about things they will not cover. Americans hate both of those ideas. <clears throat> and it's just very, very difficult in this country to implement a policy uh, like they have in Great Britain that has a system that makes decisions about whether or not they're going to cover certain procedures, for example. We had uh, Don Berwick was nominated as the uh, head of CMS several years back. He could not get confirmed because he said something positive about the British health care system. Uh, we, you know, when we debated the Affordable Care Act, that people, there, there was a provision in there to provide counseling to people uh, who were dying. And we got into this big thing about death panels, and we we're going to ration care. You know, we know how to save money in healthcare. It's very difficult to do it with the American system and the American values. And so the Affordable Care Act and health plans all try to approach it through a lot of different vehicles. And you know, I think all together they are making an impact. You saw John's numbers, and I'm sure he'll talk about this. You know, we're seeing a moderation in health spending now. That's 
possibly because people have higher co-pays and deductibles, and we know that they don't get care when they have higher co-pays and deductibles. You know, there's a lot of debate about how much you can credit the Affordable Care Act for that. But we are seeing a change in the marketplace, and those things are making a difference in spending. Uh, so I think he's a little bit wrong uh, on the cost issue. And, and the last point I would make before turning it over to John is that when Massachusetts, and John was there when Massachusetts expanded coverage, uh, and was the model for the Affordable Care Act, they made an explicit decision to expand coverage first and deal with cost second. And now they're doing some really interesting things on cost and showing some impact. And so a lot of people think now that we can do that in the country more broadly, and so we'll see. What do you think? Yeah, so just a couple of short points I'd add to that. One is, it's, you know, for example, with prescription drug coverage, it's not just, you know, should we cover a new drug that could be you know, a breakthrough drug, yes or no. It's sort of how do we sort of embolden the market to sort of create a, a more effective negotiation about what we should pay for drugs. A great example is the new medication to treat hepatitis C which is very effective, but at least in its initial sort of marketing is incredibly expensive. And, uh, and you know, other countries, one way that they bring costs down, sometimes not, you know, not putting sort of marginally effective drugs, uh, making them available in their system, but for very effective drugs, they oftentimes negotiate more vigorously, whether it's government or private programs, to reduce those costs. And, and I think we, you know, in some sense could sort of let the market work more effectively and, 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 and really, uh, you know, encourage both our public and private payers uh, to try and negotiate better prices on, on behalf of the, the, the people that they're covering. Um, and then, you know, just reflecting on the Massachusetts experience, it is true after about three years after uh, Massachusetts expanded coverage and got to near universal coverage, about 98% of the population, uh, the legislature came back and started setting sort of specific targets and sort of goals both for the, uh, you know, the, how the state was paying for care for its state employees and for its Medicaid program as well as encouraging more innovation in the private sector, uh, more around bundled payment and, uh, and, and incentives for efficiency and quality uh, that Marianne was describing are you know, part of sort of what we're seeing as demonstrations within the Affordable Care Act. I think there was a question over here. Yeah, Brianna. Hi, Brianna, how are you? <laughs> yeah, I yeah. think absolutely. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, in fact, uh, you know, I've heard some you know radio reports about uh, you know tax preparers are really gearing up to sort of help people with this because it's uh, you know, and it's also when people signed up for uh, coverage for the exchange, their subsidy was based on their projected income for the coming year, and some people will at the end of the year find that they've made less, some will have made more, and that's going to affect their subsidy and sort of how that's processed through the the tax system. So, you know, there will be, I think, uh, you know, we see sort of waves of sort of public concern about different aspects of the Affordable Care Act and, uh, you know, probably as we approach April 15th, that will become a, a more important issue. Yes, you heard it here. That will be the next big press issue where people will be like really upset about the Affordable Care Act. So, yeah. more to come. So, do you think the IRS is ready? <laughs> they say they're ready. They say they're ready. But we maybe yeah. Do we trust them? Do we think they're more ready than healthcare.gov was the first roll rollout? They know the stakes are high. <laughs> uh, back to the uh, Orwell case. Um, if I remember correctly, there's a threshold of eight percent of your income where if you pay, you would have to pay higher than that for uh, insurance. Then the individual mandate no longer applies to you. Um, and so if the subsidies go off, then people are below 8% they still have to pay, but above 8% they wouldn't. Do you know if there's any data out there to show how many people are above that, would be above that 8% without the subsidies? Yeah. It's a very good question, and I'm not very too sure, you know, of the exact proportion, although I think, you know, that's something we could talk about offline. The you know, question yeah. being, what percentage of people without the subsidies will have, uh, you know, more than nine and a half percent will be will be exempt will from be exempt, the mandate yeah. is what you're saying. Really, right. I think you know we do think that there a very high percentage of people will, would end up getting exe hardship exemptions. Mm -hmm. There's actually a quite a few of the provisions that give you a hardship exemption, and in fact, a lot of people, uh, even now in the IRS, penalty are going to have a hardship exemption one way or the other. So a lot of them will benefit or will have that. Uh, the problem is it's going to, however, create chaos. Talk about administrative issues. Uh, you know, the, no mechanism has been set up to do that kind of analysis at this point. So it is going to be very complex uh, if they rule. And of course, we think lots of people are looking at 
uh, uh, hoping that there'll be a fix. And this is one where there was just a survey that came out uh, that two-thirds of Americans want the subsidy to stay in effect. So that, that is another one of those provisions that's popular. Right, so that would require either Congress coming together yes. and sort of authorizing explicitly the, yeah. you know, the, uh, the federal exchange to give subsidies, yeah. or if Congress fails to do that, it'll be up to individual states, but as our colleague Nick Backwell wrote, uh, excuse me, Nick Bagley in the, uh, um, in the New England Journal of Medicine, it's, it's really a, a big challenge, as we discovered here in Michigan, to get agreement on a, a state exchange and one that, that has not already created one. Yeah. Uh, so there could be a significant gap in coverage and subsidies until that happens. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my question is in, in um, evaluating outcomes. <laughs> uh, the quantity things you can do, there are so many people that have it, so many don't and stuff. How do you evaluate quality? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, as a physician, it's something we think about all the time. Uh, you know, we now have some very good metrics, particularly around chronic disease, for evaluating the quality of care for hypertension, high blood pressure, for diabetes, for heart disease, for asthma, for depression. Uh, and I think we'll be, we and others will be applying those quality metrics to the newly insured to see whether they're achieving some of those important uh, goals. Um, and some of them also relate not just to whether people are getting the right tests and treatments, but is their blood pressure coming under good control? Is their blood sugar coming under big, good control? Uh, so that, I think, will really be some of the most important information that we learn from you know, coverage expansions in Michigan and elsewhere. Uh, you know, we, we've learned, uh, for example, in Massachusetts, last year colleagues and I looked at sort of the five years before and after Massachusetts expanded coverage. And what we found was relative to the rest of New England, particularly for low-income adults in, in that expansion, people up to 300% of the poverty level were eligible for uh, important subsidies. Um, we found that health outcomes as reported by the individuals improved for both physical and mental health in Massachusetts relative to the other states in New England. So, and those gains were really concentrated in the low income adults who were uh, most likely to benefit from the expanded coverage. So you know, we have some, in, there's similar indicators, particularly around mental health from the Oregon Medicaid expansion that rates of depression uh, were lower and, 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 and mental health outcomes were better after coverage ex was expanded. But it's an important question to look at going forward. And evaluating prevention. Yeah. Um, uh, and most of that, yeah, most of that's done through surveys, right? So you're sort of surveying individuals about their own experience. It's, you know, it's very hard to get actual objective data on, you know, blood pressure values or things like that because that data is not often collected. But so it's basically uh, using survey data. And, you know, what people think of as quality versus what physicians think of as quality is actually often quite different. You know, so it's a, it's a really interesting question. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So I'm just coming up to the front. Do you want a question? Are you going to say something? Do you want to say a uh, closing comment? You know? Actually, actually, we probably should have. Your very first question you had on your screen, you know, on that we talked about a little bit beforehand. What's, what's your observations about the next waiver on health insurance program and its importance? <laughs> We can all <coughs> project. I'm, I'll, I'll do a word on the importance. You can do another piece on it. Obviously, uh, it's a really challenging question because the waiver that we need for the second piece of the Affordable Care Act uh, would say that we'd raise cost sharing to 7% from 5%, which is now you know, prohibited. You know, the maximum uh, for this population up to 150% of poverty is 5%. You know, it's clearly very important to the legislature to have that waiver approved. And it would be very, very challenging if it were not approved. Um, frankly, given the politics in our state right now, I think it would be very difficult to see the <coughs> Medicaid program continuing if that waiver is not approved. The fact that HHS just approved the Indiana program, which has, <laughs> which I was surprised it has so many uh, provisions in it that I would not have thought that HHS would have approved shows you that HHS is very concerned to keep re Republican states in Medicaid. And so I, if I said I wouldn't do any predictions. I'm not doing any predictions on numbers, but I am going to do a prediction on this issue. I think they'll approve the waiver. I think they'll find a way to approve the waiver. And uh, the only point that I would add is to understand that this is a negotiation <laughs> between the state and CMS. And as, uh, you know, as we saw with Pennsylvania and Indiana, um, it's not just sort of the state making a request and you know, the federal government saying yes or no. I think there'll be plenty of uh, discussion about that because you know, from 
uh, both ends of the political spectrum, I think it's important to try and find some middle, middle ground on this point. So, uh, you know, I think the interesting question will be, you know, how much flexibility is there on either side in, in, in trying to reach an agreement? So how many of us feel healthier already? <laughs> On behalf of the Wolverine Caucus, I want to thank, from the bottom of my heart, Dr. John Ayanian and Marianne Udall Phillips, and we have these tokens of our appreciation. Please join me in thanking our speakers today. And we are honored to have been joined today by a number of officials. Uh, Representative Jim Townsend was here with us, Representative Gretchen Driscoll, and Representative Martin Haurilak, I believe, is still here, Representative Marsha Hovey Wright, and Representative Vanessa Guerra. So thank you for joining us. And also, we are joined by Vice President Cynthia Wilbanks. Um, Government Relations, University <coughs> of Michigan, and also by Rebecca DeBoot, State Relations Officer. So thank you very much. And I would like to invite you to join us again in February, on February 25th, Wednesday, February 25th at 1130. We'll be doing a joint forum with the Lansing Community College at the administration building on the first floor and we'll be presenting on Students Creating Community Innovations, talking about hands-on learning in a digital world. So without further ado, we will grant you a good afternoon, and we look forward to seeing you in February, and go blue. <laughs>